welcome everybody. Thank you for coming. And uh, it's a pleasure to have here today uh, Dr. Venkate Saligrama from Boston University. Uh, Dr. Saligrama is a faculty in the e e ECE department at the Bo uh, BU. He got his PhD uh, from MIT. In fact, for full disclosure, he was a graduate student when I was a researcher at MIT back when. I'm not going to say when. And uh, he's re. 13th century. He's, uh, yeah, something like that. Uh, his uh, interests uh, span many different areas, uh, and uh, uh, in particular, signal processing, statistical learning, video processing, information and decision theory. Uh, he has edited a book on network sensing, information and control. He served uh, in various capacities uh, uh, the IEEE, uh, and in particular as the AE for the uh, transaction on IT and signal processing, and served in several committees. Uh, he's a recipient of numeral, numerous awards, in, uh, including the uh, Presidential Early Career, or PKs, uh, from NSF and the ONR Young Investigator Award and uh, uh, he's very well known in the area. He spans many different uh, uh, fields and it's a, a great pleasure to have him here and I, I found out actually this morning that I, I thought this was sort of a, a, a passing interest but apparently he's very much interested in topic modeling. Uh, which is uh, very nice to us, and uh, thank you very much, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Hamid, uh, for inviting me here. It's a pleasure to be at uh, NCSU. This is my first time, and I see that you have a huge campus here, uh, very new <laughs> for a Bostonian, you know, with snow drifting all over the place. It looks very clean as well. Uh, so today I'll be spending time talking about a geometric approach for learning latent mixed membership models. This is joint work with my graduate student Wei Kong Ding and a fellow faculty member Prakash Ishwar. A lot of this work is done by Wei Kong Ding. So if there are any mistakes or good things about it, it's all due to him. Okay? He's actually graduating and he's looking around for jobs. He's done some very phenomenal piece of work. So just uh, advertisement for him. And here are a list of papers that he has been able to generate just in the past couple of years at ICML, which is a major conference in machine learning. NIPS is another conference in machine learning. And AI Stats is another conference in machine learning. So if you have any questions about this particular talk, there are these papers where you can find a lot of this material. So here is an outline for my talk. What I'm going to first talk about are latent mixture models. So this talk is not necessarily just about topic models, but broadly speaking, about latent mixture models, where there are certain latent things, and you want to infer them from observations. So as a canonical case, we'll first consider topic models and the estimation problem. And then we will look at the geometry of these topic models. Then I will provide you with algorithms that which, which have certain guarantees by exploiting this geometry. Then we will extend these topic models to the rank aggregation problem and then show some real world experiments. So a machine learning researcher without uh, any real world experiments is not really you know, worth his name. So you have to have these experiments. I mean, they should work in practice. Uh, so if you have any questions, please uh, interrupt me. I will be happy to answer as and when you have questions. Okay? So the main thing that take home message at this slide I, I want you to go away from is that unlike most of the other types of work going on in this literature, which, are all, which is not necessarily not only fragmented, but also you know, uh, focused on algorithms, we are basically looking at guarantees as well. And these guarantees means that we are looking at statistical guarantees. That is, how much data do you need in order to figure out these latent factors? And how fast can we figure those things out? 
So we are interested in sample complexity issues and computational complexity issues, okay? So that's like a high level point that I want to, I want to convey. So what are mixed membership latent variable models? Here are many, many different examples. You may have text documents and text documents are your observations and you can think of text documents as a mixture of latent topics. You can also look at connections in a network as observations and then those connections in the network can be thought of as mixtures produced by latent commun communities. You can also look at user preferences and those user preferences may be a combination of latent ranking factors, okay? So there are many, many, many different, there's actually a long list of different things that can be thought of as a mixture of latent topics. So let's start with a very simple example. Here is a text document. Typically what happens is that you extract words from this document and once you extract words from this document, you produce counts such as this where gene appears three times, DNA appears once, genet genetics appears twice and so on. So those are the observations that you can extract from a document such as this. Once you extract those, what are the latent factors? This is where the modeling part comes in. You could you could think of topics in the following way. There are underlying unobserved latent factors that result in these kinds of words. So for instance, there could be an underlying topic called genetics which results in these three words. Evolution could result in those words. Data science could result in those words. Now I have made them all disjoint. They don't have to be disjoint there could be some overlap between words that could be used both in evolution and in topics uh, and in genetics. So in some sense, topics is a distribution of over different words and those distributions could overlap with each other. So in some sense, what this is showing is that the document can be thought of as a mixture of latent topics. Here is another model just to convey the point that you don't have to have text documents. You could have, you could think about this in many different contexts. You may record user preferences such as this. You may go to Amazon and look at all the ratings of different users and then record what happens to a particular user when shown these two movies. And the user might say, well, that user might like this movie or the other and then you would put a count of one there and a count of zero for the other comparison. That is the, 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 the fact that this is bigger than this and so on. So here again, there are influencing factors which we call as latent factors and this user might be influenced just by the actor in, those move, in that particular movie or in a bunch of movies and maybe the reason why this rating arises for that user or many users. So some users may be influenced by the actors in movies. Some users may be uh, influenced by the fact that it's a musical versus a non-musical. Some other users may be influenced by special effects versus non-special effects. Again, you have various influencing factors which you do not know and you want to use these user preferences and figure out what are those influencing factors. So document is a document here, which means the user preferences is a mixture of latent influencing factors. So what is the overall goal? The overall goal of, our, of my talk here is to learn or estimate these latent factors from observations, which I'm calling it documents. And the goal is to develop algorithms with provable guarantees. What I mean by provable guarantees is that how many dogs fundamentally do I need to estimate these latent factors within a tolerance? And computational cost, how does this algorithm scale with the number of parameters? And I want to also go and look at real world data sets 
and make sure I get very good empirical performance on different types of real world data sets. Okay, on web scale applications, which means fairly large, uh, large applications. Okay, so I have introduced, I hope, conveyed to you what latent mixture models are. Now we are, we are going to formally get into what, what I mean by topic models and look at the estimation problem for these topic models. So again, this is the slide from before. We are going to use this as an example to illustrate our point. So I, I hope everybody remembers, again, you, you have these kinds of documents, you extract words out of this document, you get these counts, those are your observations, and then you're looking for topics. And the topics can be bunched up into these different categories, and the goal is to figure out these topics. What does that mean? So you can imagine a topic to be a distribution, probability distribution over these different words. So you can think about beta 1, 1, beta 2, 1 corresponding to topic 1, beta 1, k, beta 2, k, beta w, k corresponding to topic k. So there is something called a topic matrix and each component tells me how often do I see word 1 in that topic. So w is the size of the vocabulary, k is the number of topics. For this talk, we are going to just assume that we know k, okay? But a fundamental question in topic modeling is also about how do you figure out what should k be? Just for simplicity, we are just going to live with the fact that somebody told us there are k number of topics, okay? Now, corresponding to each document or each user, there, there is something, you can associate something called a weight matrix. What are these weight matrices? So if I were to take one document, then that document's word frequency patterns depends on a mixture of these topics. So one document could be primarily about genetics, in which case it will be primarily about the first column, and so the weight here will be predominant very close to one, and all the others will be very close to zero. Other documents could be you know, more spread out, it could be something about everything, in which case you will see this theta to be all over the place. So you get these word frequency patterns for different documents, which look like beta times theta, okay? That's good news, but the bad news is you don't need, you do not know beta, you do not know theta. And if you look at theta, it is, it has many more parameters which are unknown than beta. So you, you want to somehow solve this problem by first attacking how to extract topics by leveraging the fact that uh, you have observed lots and lots of these documents, okay? You're going to let m go to infinity and w is a fixed size vocabulary. And then you want to understand how large should m be in order to figure these kinds of things out, okay? Now, unfortunately, you don't get to observe A. What you get to observe are sampling, like a multinomial sampling from this, these columns. So how is a document generated? It, there is an underlying model which says that A equals beta times theta, and then you take each column of A. Each column of A tells me what is the probability distribution for the different words. You then toss a coin n times, and then generate these words, n words in the document. Because each document is finite. And how do you generate that finite document, which consists of n words? You toss a multinomial coin with these frequencies and then generate these types of words, okay? So that's how you get a document. So every column generates a document like that. So indeed, there's a noise going on here, right? So you only get to observe this but you are supposed to figure out this and this. Yeah? Would it be possible to apply any of the recent matrix factorization algorithms to this sort of problem? Ma matrix factorization is indeed related to this problem, but uh, it's even called non-negative. This falls in the category of problems called non-negative matrix factorization. The, the, the general matrix factorization work involves you know, positive and negative entries and things like this. Here, uh, we have much more structure, 
where beta is stochastic, which means these things add up to 1, and every theta is column stochastic, and then every column of this is stochastic. So we hope to do much better than standard matrix factorization. In fact, this problem by itself, I will go over this, is known to be NP-hard, so it's hopeless. Even if I were to give you A and ask you to solve for beta and theta, you, you pretty much uh, cannot, if P is not equal to NP, you pretty much have no hope of solving this, okay? So you need more structure in order to solve these types of problems. And then we'll, we'll talk about this more, yeah? So you only, you only know X and you want to... You only know X, that's right, you which, is a, which is a sampling, N sampling from those columns, and then you want to figure out beta and theta, okay? This is, this is okay, so we have defined the problem. Our problem is to find, given x and the number of topics k, which is the dimension of this, we want to estimate beta and theta, of course. Estimating theta is not a big deal if we know beta. Why? Because it's a least squares type problem, Li linear regression. So just to give you an understanding of what these kinds of numbers look like, K looks like 100, W looks like 10,000, uh, the number of words that you sample in each document look like 100. Even though we looked at this big document consisting of a lot of words, there are only 100 words that you would typically extract from such a document. Why? Because you're going to kill words such as is, the, and so on, right? Like a term ID kind of a thing, you'll just kill most of those words and what will remain are those hundred words. And the number of documents typically would be like hundred thousand or something. Okay, we'll look at much bigger problems, but I'm just, just to give you an indication of <coughs> what kinds of things we are looking at. Now related work, this goes back to Draw's question, um, isn't this related to matrix factorization? Yes, it is matrix factorization. The question is how do we solve these matrix factorization problems? So the general non-negative matrix factorization problem deals with the problem of given A, there's no noise or nothing stochastic about it, given A can, and deterministic beta and deterministic theta, can you figure out beta and theta? And this problem is known to be NP-hard and Aurora in 2012 in Fox uh, proved this result and so lots of heuristics and approximations have been used to solve this type of problem using some kind of a regularized joint optimization approach. What, that, what does that mean? You hold beta fixed, you solve for theta, and then you hold theta fixed and solve for beta, or you know, you, have, you pose a joint global optimization and then do some alternative minimization. I mean, I'm giving you one version of this algorithm. There are many of those kinds of things. Then in, in, in actually, Blay et al. in 2003 came up with their very, very interesting paper using Bayesian methods where you had a prior distribution on beta, you had a prior distribution on theta, and the distribution on theta, what does it look like? Think of it as a distribution over distribution because theta itself is a probability distribution. And so you are looking at distribution over distribution, so it's like a probability simplex. And they used a max likelihood or a maximum a posterior approach to figure out beta and theta. Again, this is highly non-convex, and so they suggest all kinds of variational techniques to find gradients, and then they look at approximations like MCMC to figure these kinds of things out. Then another line of work is what is called as method of movements. What you do is you do a tensorization of this beta theta. You take second order tensor, third order tensor, and then find, do an SVD, and then figure out beta and theta. Now that works, but it requires some kind of uh, strong priors on the theta matrix in order to guarantee that you do recover these kinds of things. Okay? More importantly, for a machine learning researcher, they do not really report how well it does on real world examples. The way, the, our focus is on the last line here. 
which is topic separability and I will explain to you what topic separability means. It is a geometric perspective and more recently what we have shown actually one of the student Wei Kong Ding was able to show that it actually does that meaning he was able to show that every these Bayesian methods naturally have a geometry, geometric structure and so our methods could also be interpreted as actually solving these hard map or ML problems where these map and ML problems uh, use some kind of priors and those priors result in naturally separable type of matrices and we can actually give guarantees for this. Okay. Now this kind of sub topic separability base itself is quite old. In fact, both Aurora and us, we started looking at this problem simultaneously and uh, we, have, we, we have had several results over the past couple of years. Okay. So with that, let me jump in and say what, what I mean by geometric structure of these topic models. Now this is quite elementary, but the main point that take home message this is a very important point I want to make is that if you scale things up, if, my, if the vocabulary size W is fairly large and the number of topics is fairly small, the inevitable outcome of high dimensionality by high dimensionality I mean the number of words in your vocabulary being large, inevitable outcome of it is that it leads to this geometrical structure. Okay? Because of that you can think of these Bayesian methods as being embedded into, into problems that naturally have this geometric structure and therefore we can use our algorithms to solve those kinds of problems. So what do I mean by geometric structure? So let's, so as I said, our main focus is going to be to solve beta matrix. Now this beta matrix is, has many rows and many columns. Each one of those rows, each one of those columns, right, is a frequency distribution over, is a distribution over different words. A lambda separable matrix is a matrix such that for every topic there exists at least one word such that if you focus on that word which means that row then the, it is dominant, diagonally dominant. In other words the word one appears at a much higher frequency than those, those other, uh, than, 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 than the frequency with which that word appears in other, doc, other topics. So I, I <coughs> I think I garbled a little bit, but uh, just to be clear, what I'm saying is, what is lambda separability? It means that for every topic, there exists at least one word such that if you look at its <coughs> frequency for all the other topics, if you look at the frequency of that word for all the other topics, then that word is dominant in this topic. You don't know which word it is. There is some word such that this is true. But it, it's not a specific uh, threshold lambda, or it's just generically dominant. Generically <laughs> dominant, okay? <laughs> to understand this better, it is useful to consider the case when lambda is identically zero. What does that mean? What am I really saying? What am I saying? If lambda is identically zero, then your topic matrix will have some structure like right? So there will be beta 1, 0, 0, beta 3, 0, 0. There may be more words, but there is at least one word with having this, having this property. This is called as a completely separable topic matrix, where you have these zeros for some of the words, but then after that it can be anything. It does not have to be zero. Right. What does that mean? It means the following. It means that Supposing this topic is about genetics and you see the word DNA, then the word DNA is fundamentally has to be only about genetics. That is, and if you see the word computer, it is a signal that it is about data. It cannot be about genetics. So that is what lambda equals zero case means. It means that if I, there must exist some word such that the presence of that word 
happens only if a particular topic is present. Otherwise, it doesn't happen. That's what it means. But we don't need this. We need something weaker like that, which is there are words that are more dominant than in a particular topic than other topics. Okay. Now, here is one of our main results. We are going to ask the question is, is this notion of approximately separable a fundamental notion? What, we, what I want to argue is that in real world problems, whenever the size of the vocabulary W is far bigger than the number of topics, <coughs> such as these kinds of problems in Wikipedia, you may have you know, so many words from the vocabulary, Twitter may have this many words from the vocabulary, New York Times, and so on, where you see this happening. The number of words from the vocabulary are far, far bigger than the number of topics. Whenever this happens, I'm arguing that separability for many, many general class of models, that generative models that you can consider, turns out to have the separable structure, approximately separable structure. So what do I mean by a generative model? So for instance, one generative model is something called this plate model. I don't know how many of you are familiar with this representation. So a plate model is a graphical description of how to generate documents. So how, do, how does this work? You have a parameter beta naught, which is some constant, and that goes into this box. What k means, this rectangle with k means, you are generating k different topics. So you, you, you hold this beta naught constant and toss a coin and generate k different vectors taking support in this w. And each one of those realized, realized vectors becomes a topic distribution. And so that is this part. And in here, you're generating the theta matrix. And then finally, you're generating the x matrix used by tossing the coin n times by multiplying this beta with the realization of the theta. Okay? So that's how this is supposed to work. So if you were to take such a plate representation, we can prove the following result, we can show that supposing W is larger than this quantity, let's not worry about what this quantity is for now, W is larger than some, some constant times the number of topics, then immediately the probability that beta is not lambda separable goes to zero as W to the power minus T. So if I have T equals 50 times K, which is even 50, even 50 is too small a number, if you were to look at these kinds of things, certainly 50 times 50 is still much smaller than this. You're going to immediately look at order of W to the minus 50, practically non-existent, uh, non-existent uh, lambda. So the minute you consider, start considering these kinds of generative models, you end up with this type of situation. That is, almost surely, as the number of uh, words go to infinity, almost surely, you will end up with a completely separable matrix for these types of generative models. Not separable. Uh, yeah, yeah. Huh? Probability, probability that beta is not lambda separable goes to zero. As the number of uh, words increases number of words increases or t goes to infinity. Right. Yeah. Right. And for even for any general classes of problems that we want to consider, certainly this is too small a number to even worry about it. Okay. So, so what does t mean here? t is this thing multiplying k. Yeah, I mean, does it have any physical meaning? No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. It's a scaling factor. Oh. It's just a scaling factor. Your yeah, it's the it's the vocabulary divided by the number of topics. Physical meaning is this divided by that. How about that? Yes. So the, the the main quantity here is obviously there is an exponential that I hid, which is e to the power beta zero k. Right. Obviously, beta zero k explodes. 
uh, then you are going to be in trouble, right. So naturally we are interested in is what is this quantity beta 0 k. So interestingly, if I choose beta 0 to be 0 0.01 for instance and do 1000 Monte Carlo runs, then for these different data sets you will observe something like this. For the NIPS data set, the probability lambda equals 0 0.01 is 100 percent, meaning it is always separable. For the Wikipedia data set, it is 99.9 .9 percent separable and Twitter data set is 100 percent and so on. So very close to 100, right. It is very, very close to 100 percent for uh, this separability. Yeah, Rob. So when, when I am seeing numbers like 99.9 .9 percent, um, I like, I, I get the feeling that maybe the model, the overall approach is not perhaps like not, not keeping in mind various subtle points because like, you know, in, in real life things are always m more complicated than things that are like 99.1. No, think about what we are trying to say. What we are trying to say is as you increase the number of words, there exists at least one word such that for that particular word has a much higher frequency for this topic. Okay, then the other topic. But what if that word doesn't exist in your article? So if that word doesn't exist in your article, you can't identify that that's. So that is where all this problem, that's the perhaps the reason why you don't get 100 and you get slightly less than 100 perhaps, right. Meaning it is all about taking limits at this point. So you, you can use mathematics to sort of get you, get you insights and once you get insights, you can, you can sort of nail down. Uh, what it is that, what is the structure of these kinds of problems and that is that's, that's perhaps the way to see it rather than like, an, like a completely finite study. Okay, and what if you will have an article that has two different words from two completely separate topics? That will mean that it is a joint topic article? So actually if I step back a little bit, what we are saying here has something to do with this generative model. So uh, you may come up with pathological generative models or some other generative models. For instance, your generative model is a case where uh, this may not happen because I can create generative models in the following way. I can fix a beta matrix completely, a priori fix the beta matrix and ask you to figure that out no matter what. That is an NP-hard problem. There is nothing one can do about it. So this is not trying to claim that we can prove NP, NP hard problems to be polynomial or something. So somewhere something has to give way, right. If you want to solve problems in an efficient way, then what we are saying is a lot of the generative models that people have been using results in a structure such as this. Just to be sure, the, the smaller lambda is the better of the law. The smaller lambda is the better of the law. How to understand the figure 99.9 plus 0.3? Like that's no, that's a like confidence. So maybe 0.3 percent. So it is uh, 3 divided by 0.3 by 100. Then the whole number exceeds 100. No, no, 0.3 by 100 okay. divided by 100. Yeah. So we are assuming the same lambda for all the matrix. I, I can't hear. You. Yeah, speak louder. So we are assuming just constant lambda for all the columns of the matrix. Yeah. No, not what do you mean all the columns? Like lambda is like a scalar. So for when you say that it's lambda separable, lambda is No, every row it doesn't have to have a lambda. I just want one, at least one word to have such a lambda. All the other, most of the words or almost every other word apart from k words could have completely unknown distributions, unknown uh, betas. But he means you, you define your lambda globally. I have defined the lambda globally and uh, the only reason is not because the mathematics is hard. In fact, you can have very general notions. You can have the norm of the rest of the things being smaller than the norm of these, uh, these uh, dominant words and things like that. It just becomes messy to discuss those kinds of things. This is a very simple way to explain it. So there are many other definitions that can be used. but uh, they are all equivalent in some sense. So anyway, coming coming to this beta 0 0.01, if you come back here and look at what people do in practice, 
they indeed set, why did we pick beta 0 equals 0.001? Because that's the default value that these Bayesian methods are using to compute their MAP and ML estimates. In fact, they even suggest even smaller beta. They suggest that you want to pick beta 0 to be C by W, which is even smaller than uh, picking beta 0 to be 0 0.01. What's C? C is some constant, like 200 or something. They want to pick 200 by W or something like this, which is now scaling with the size of the vocabulary. So in any case, if you look at these empirical packages, you will immediately come to the conclusion that underneath their hood is a fact where they are essentially assuming the topics to be approximately separable. That means they are assuming that this to be true. Okay? So our ex analysis actually explains the reasoning for this choice. Okay, so now we have gained some insight into what a topic matrix looks like. So I want to exploit this fact in order to figure out the topic. That's our main problem. So for the for simplicity, I will first consider lambda equals zero case to get you to a point where you will appreciate what is going on. So supposing lambda equals zero, what does lambda equals zero? It means that there are some words which have completely zero frequency for other topics. What happens? So let's say word one was the so-called novel word. <coughs> then you will get beta times theta for the A matrix will be beta one theta one. And that will be some point here. So if I were to take theta one as your vector in some high dimensional space, all the novel words are going to be along that ray. Generate another other topic. Now this topic, novel word or predominant word is beta 3. That is going to be along that a different direction, theta 2. And so every time you have a predominant word, you are going to generate points along that ray and so on. After that, what happens? After that, this is a very important point you will get some mixture of these rays. And the mixture of these rays are a positive combination, which means if I were to define a cone consisting of these three rays, then all the points will be in this cone. I don't know where, but they will be in this cone. Why don't I know where? Because betas only sum up to one along columns. They don't sum up to one along the rows. So they could be distributed anywhere but I know they are in this cone. Now I want to use this fact that they are in this positive cone. How do I use this fact? Project it onto a simplex. If I project it all down to a simplex, what happens? Everything that was on this ray goes to 1 along, everything on this ray goes to 1, everything along that, that ray goes to 1, everything in the middle goes to something inside. So that's what happens. So everything here projects onto that point, everything which was pure projects onto that point, everything pure projects onto that point, everything else is kind of inside. Not only inside, it's a, it's a simplex combination of these three points. By simplex combination, what one means is that the this is a weighted combination of these three points and the weights add up to one. Okay? So now the problem of topic matrix estimation just boils down to figuring out what these three points are. If we had, if we simply had, yeah. I couldn't have done that even if the first six rows were linear combinations of theta one, theta two and theta three. But I cannot disambiguate. I cannot disambiguate which one is theta one. Indeed, right? Uh, if I if I don't didn't give you these novel words, then there's no way you can disambiguate what is theta one because they're you can you can essentially interchange them and call you can interchange everything, right? 
but just through permutation. Non yeah, it's non very reminiscent, by the way, of, uh, of subspace separability. Uh -huh. uh, you know, in in the union of subspace. Uh, I see. I see. Yeah. So the normal word detection problem boils down to the topic matrix estimation. So you have this probability simplex. But all of the work is not kind of done. There is one, one irritating thing. When you have finite words, in reality, you don't get those points. You get those circles with, you get the donuts. You're not going to get, get, get those filled uh, donuts, but you're going to get those other donuts. Right, the real donuts, and the question is, from those donuts, how do how are you going to figure those things out? Now there are two algorithms. What one simple algorithm that I'm going to talk about here is based on uh, looking at word-word co-occurrences. So the key issue here is, if I fix the number of words in a document, and this perhaps goes back to Dror's question, then some words will never appear. So indeed, then you will get some perturbation of the simplex. So the perturbation never vanishes. How are you going to recover the thing from this perturbation? Okay, so here is what we do. We have this situation, but we never observe A. We observe something like a donut of that. But if you were to take X tilde, X tilde transpose, then as M goes to infinity, what ends up happening is that you can think of this as converging to a word-word co-occurrence. If the word-word co-occurrence is well defined and by law of large numbers, it converges fairly fast to this word-word co-occurrence matrix. Then you have gotten rid of the noise through this averaging process. You can, instead of looking at cross-document frequencies, you can look at word-word co-occurrences. So now you can think of each one of these points as a high dimensional vector where if I take word one, which was supposed to be the separable word, you can look at a W dimensional vector and this W dimensional vector is, is essentially the word co-occurrence for that word with all the other words and that would be this point. The word co-occurrence was for the fourth, third and fourth word corresponding to the third topic will be that point and the word word co-occurrence for the uh, fifth and sixth word would be uh, would be the third topic if it be this third topic so third topic second topic and the first topic so that's how that's the geometry of the problem so you will end up getting that if you could get that then how would you solve the problem How you would solve the problem is to find extreme points of a convex hull. How would I find very easily the extreme points of a convex hull? I do random projections. I just take a line, one dimensional line, project the entire or every word onto this one dimensional line. So take every word, look at its frequencies, co-occurrence frequencies, take a random line, project it. If I project this simplex onto this line, what happens? This point comes here, that point goes here, that point goes here. All these guys go somewhere in the middle of this interval, which implies that just by taking the maximum, I can associate whoever, whichever word gives me the maximum value must be an extreme point. Whichever gives me the minimum value is another extreme point. So by just taking random projections and computing the maximum and minimum, Right, you can associate them with these extreme uh, with these extreme points. So now you have extracted all the words that correspond to the novel words. Okay, how many such random projections do you need? Typically, of the order of the number of topics, which is like 50. If you have 50 topics, the number of projections scale with 50. Why is that? It's somewhat related to the solid angles subtended by each one of those points. To see that, let's look at this picture. How many times does this word participate in being the maximum? Well, if your random direction falls anywhere in the shaded region, then this point will be the maximum value for every random direction that spans this. 
and so on, right. So, an algorithm that is suggested by this is the following. Take some amount of k times some constant times of projections, look at how many times each word is a maximum, depending on and sort them in decreasing order and look at the top k of these frequencies. Is the algorithm clear? So, what you do is you take random projection and project every word onto this onto this line. Look at how many times for how many random projections does this word participate in being the maximum and sort them like a histogram and cut off at k. This is an interesting algorithm uh, because it also allows us to solve the case for lambda not equal to 0, okay. Why is that? So, if lambda is not equal to 0, indeed I do not have any extreme points. The ideal extreme points have vanished. They have now been perturbed. This guy gets perturbed here, not too far away, but he gets perturbed here. This guy gets perturbed here. That guy gets perturbed here. But in addition, a new point has been added because you will have other points that are extreme points because all it guarantees is that this point has to be in the convex hull of these guys, these guys, but not these guys. So, you will in introduce extra extreme points, but that is not a big deal. Why is it not a big deal? Even though you have this as your simplex, meaning this as your polygon now and not that as your polygon, by looking at how many times these projections lead to maxima, you can see that this guy participates in being the maximum far more times than this guy because this guy participates in being the maximum a far fewer times because it is not predominant. His lambda is somewhat much bigger, that is our assumption. Because his lambda is somewhat bigger, this guy participates in the maximum only if the random direction falls into this region. The probability that the random projection falls into this region is far smaller than the probability it falls into that region. So, that is how we can recover the true extreme points and get rid of these extraneous extreme points. So, here is the final result. I promised you that uh, I will have a computational guarantee as well as a sample complexity guarantee. So, what is our computational guarantee? We say that if you if you have k topics, n words per document and m different documents, then it scales linearly, the computational complexity scales linearly with m, n and k. And we have w times k cubed here, which it scales in the, with the cube of the k and this is possibly our bounding technique, I do not know. We are trying to sort that out. On the other hand, we also can come up with a sample complexity result which tells me that with probability less than probability greater than 1 minus delta, we can guarantee that if you have the number of documents to be some polynomial of the vocabulary size and the number of topics, you can guarantee that uh, you will recover the topic matrix within you know L1 norm or L infinity norm, any one of these norms, the poly will be different for different norms. So, L infinity is a stronger topology than uh, L2 for instance. So, L2 will require somewhat less, L1 will require a little more, L infinity will require even more and so on. But everything kind of boils down to this kind of a result. That if I were to have more than this many documents with probability greater than uh, 1 minus delta, my estimated beta matrix will be close to the true beta matrix. And then from there I do a linear regression and I also get theta and I have the whole thing, okay. Note that because of the random projection nature of the algorithm, I can distribute it and do a distributed implementation. So, imagine different, different servers have different numbers of documents. You can process your own thing, do your random projections on your server and just send the output of these random projections to the fusion center, which then adds up these frequency patterns and figures out the topics for you. 
So in fact, with a very, very low communication cost, you can also guarantee that you can recover these topics in a completely distributed manner, okay? So some experimental results here. Um, you have a, how much time do I have? You have about maybe let's say five minutes. <coughs> okay. So, so experimental results. So this is, this, this kind, kind of sounds uh, crazy because I'm saying semi-synthetic when I promise to you uh, we are going to look at real world. What, do, what does one mean by I also have real world results, but the reason we do semi-synthetic uh, data is because if I give you New York Times data, nobody knows what the ground truth is. So how do you, how do you create a ground truth and test the validity of your algorithm? So what we do is to take a MCMC -MC method which may be true, may not be true, who knows, but we use a MCMC -MC method and estimate these topic matrices and we estimate the theta matrix, all of this we estimate. Once we have estimated those, we hold the beta to be fixed and generate topics using that beta. This helps us ground truth the whole thing in terms of how well do we approximate the ground truth, which is kind of the MCMC, how well do we approximate uh, the MCMC uh, problem. And it also helps us generate synthetic documents to see what would happen as the number of documents increases to infinity. So if you look at that, you can, you can solve this problem in two ways. One is once you have generated the synthetic, B, you have extracted this beta, you can, you can add novel words of your own and test whether or not your algorithm works well. And in that case, you can see that the error goes to zero quite fast, whereas the MCMC -MC method does not go to zero. Why is that? That's obvious because MCMC -MC method is not exploiting your new novel words that have been added. So the error kind, kind of stays the same. On the other hand, it's also interesting that if you do not even add the novel words, keep the beta as it is, which may have separability or not have separability, then you, you are in fact comparable to the the MCMC -MC algorithm. And why is that? This goes back to our point that the MCMC -MC methods inherently are assuming that you are approximately separable. So in some sense, our algorithm is performing as well as the very complicated map or ML uh, estimation. An important thing obviously is computational cost. So if you look at an MCMC -MC method and you want to guarantee this amount of error, it takes about a couple of hours in order to in order to get you to that error. This is the L1 error. Whereas we take less than like 50 seconds to get you down to those kinds of errors. Okay. So that is the upshot of this. You can fairly quickly come to the correct answer instead of MCMC if you were to use these types of techniques. Now here is a typical set of things that you would generate as topics from, from a method such as this. You would generate four topics. If you were to generate four topics, then you would, you would get these words in one topic, these words in another topic, these words in another topic, and they all look fairly nice, right? Although, you, you know, nobody knows whether this is the topic, whether we have associated these words and a human being has said, oh, this looks like weather and associated with weather, right? So, so uh, going back to my earlier topic, you see in... This may have been true in 2002, but in 2015, Al Gore probably means climate change and not politics. <laughs> so, so this is this, what I'm what I'm really trying to say is that like the, the subtleties are are so strong that making any mathematical comment seems, uh, you know, kind of forced and relies very strongly on assumptions that we have uh, about you know whatever general mathematical framework is being used. Maybe let's delay this question yeah, uh, a couple of yeah. minutes, otherwise I won't get through my yeah, talk. Yeah, let's take it off one. Yeah. Uh, so I, the, the point is I do want to point out that while I have only been talking about documents, this methodology applies to community detection, it applies to rank aggregation problem, it applies to many, many different problems. 
rank aggregation problem looks very different from the topic modeling problem that we have been talking about. Still, you can lift everything, roll it up, and make it look like a topic model, and our methodology just can be applied for this seemingly different problem. So again, what is, the, uh, what is this problem? So mixed membership model. So you have user preferences, such as Amazon or something. And then you, 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 you present, you randomly select two movies for a user, two movies for a user, and ask him or her, which movie do you like? And they rate it. OK, I like this movie or the other. So you have these pairwise comparisons. So you generate some n pairwise comparisons. So supposing there are w movies now, how many comparisons are possible? w times w minus 1. So out of which you, s you randomly select n possible comparisons. That's our generative model. And ask the user to rate them. Now, each user becomes a document. What is the document? The document is the set of all these pairwise comparisons. Now, you want to ask the question, what is the underlying rankings that the user is using? Now, you, the, now the user is not very rational, right? And different users are pretty, pretty different from each other. Some users use maybe certain criteria for some movies and some other users use some other criteria. So there is heterogeneity here. And the second thing that you will realize is the same user may be influenced by act actor for this comparison, by, but by some other reason, like a musical or something, for another uh, comparison. So there is also heterogeneity within the user itself. So how do we model this situation? We can model the situation as there exists an underlying set of rank orderings, which you do not know about, and you're going to get a mixture of these underlying rankings. And the goal is to figure out what these underlying rankings are. So that is the problem. Okay. So again, the main point is to think of what should be the topic matrix in this case. So you're getting pairwise comparisons, and basically, you can think of this as a distribution over if you had q items, q minus times q different items. So each component here for this particular column is a comparison. And this comparison can be thought of as a probability that movie 1 is rated over movie 2 in this latent factor. So if actor is important, then what is the probability that movie 1 is rated over movie 2 if you hold actor as the criteria? If you hold musical as the criterion, what is the probability that movie 1 is rated over movie 2? And so on. So this is abstractly speaking, that is your latent set of influencing factors that you do not know about. And this goes into the theory of what is called as Malo's model that I'm not talking about and incorporates uh, even things where you can flip things. These are not deterministic. So you give one a particular baseline permutation you can allow for switching of the switching of the different orders and realize a different permutation from the other permutation and these kinds of things are called as Malos models. And from those Malos models, this beta pairwise comparisons are extracted. So the goal at the end of the day is to figure out these baseline permutations and what is the probability of flipping these baseline permutations for each one of those columns. So this problem, through some little bit of work, can be completely lifted back into our topic modeling using the same plate representation. What ends up happening is the words are now replaced by number of comparisons. So if I have W movies, or if I had Q movies, the number of words will be Q times Q minus 1 different words. The number of topics is the number of latent rankings that you do not know about. The number of users is the number of documents. And n is the number of comparisons per user. Again, there is a lot of work along this. I'm running out of time, so I'm going to move on. We can talk about this. This is very recent work that we have done. And again, you can come up with a very similar result for seemingly different problem that, again, you get very good computational complexity as well as very good sample complexity, which is polynomial in the number of items and so on. Okay, again, we can do the semi-synthetic data experiments. I'll move on 
because I don't have time to discuss these ideas. This is something that I think one of uh, Hamid's students was talking about perplexity, right? You were talking about perplexity. So if you were to look at this perplexity measure and ask the question, how well we do with respect to other comparable methods using this perplexity measure, you will see that we are doing much better. What does this perplexity measure do? It does something, supposing I want to, I have a bunch of users. Think of this as a matrix completion problem where a certain user has not rated or compared two particular movies. And you want to ask the question, predict what that user would do for that particular movie. And you can then uh, predict these things, compare with the ground truth, compare with other competing algorithms and come up with these normalized log likelihood scores and see which algorithm is performing better. That is one thing you can do. The second thing you can do, which is a different plot, is if I do not have these users, I get, I, I, I get a new user in the system who has not rated anything before. How do I use all of this thing? Now I know beta matrix. I don't care about the theta matrix because I don't know the, for the user's theta. I can marginalize out the theta and ask the question, if I'm a generic new user, what would be my ratings? And again, I can use ground truth and compare against them and get, uh, you know, get performance comparable to other types of methods. So that, that's what this, this is about. And finally, we can look at comparisons to matrix completion and look at Bayesian methods, which gives you this and takes several days to really get these answers, whereas ours gets you the answers comparable to the best Bayesian method fairly quickly using these random predictions. So I'll summarize. What have we done? We take, we, this is the way to think about it. There are lots and lots of problems that deal with latent factor models. What we are saying here is that many of these models, if by virtue of high dimensionality, can be approximated by approximately separable models. If that geometry is true, which is the simple geometry, then immediately you can design efficient randomized algorithms and obtain consistency, efficiency, and state-of-the-art performance. Thank you. We have a time for maybe one or two questions maximum. Any questions? I hope I didn't confuse everybody. <laughs> All right. Okay. We'll, uh, uh, we'll take any questions, I guess, offline because we're out of time and they have to go off, offline here. So let's thank our speaker again. Thank you. <coughs> They have to disconnect. Yeah.